learn more about the alkane functional group. In this lecture, we'll cover alkane nomenclature, the physical properties of alkanes, and the chemical reactions they can undergo. The simplest type of alkane to name is what's called a straight chain alkane. As we've seen before, alkanes never truly have straight chains. Because of their geometry and the tetrahedral geometry around the carbon atom, they tend to form more of a zigzag shape in three dimensions. Still, we refer to an alkane that has one carbon after another in a long line as straight chain to differentiate from carbons which can branch in different directions, and we'll study those later on. Naming straight chain alkanes is very easy because each name simply consists of two parts, a prefix and a suffix. The prefix indicates the number of carbons in the chain. The suffix, because we're dealing with the functional group alkanes, is the letters A-N-E, pronounced ain, just like in the word alkane. The only tricky thing about naming straight chain alkanes is that it's the first time we're going to see the prefixes that are common throughout organic chemistry. We'll learn the first 10 prefixes. These can be used for naming alkanes as well as all of the other molecules we'll be working with this quarter. As you can imagine, we use the same prefixes but change the suffixes for different functional groups. So, if you want to name the simplest alkane possible, that would be an alkane that consists of just one carbon atom. We've already seen this molecule in several different examples, but now we know why it's named what it is. To name an alkane that has one carbon atom, I noticed that one carbon corresponds to the prefix meth, M-E-T-H. Then, because it's an alkane, all single bonds, I add the suffix, A-N-E, and this is where we get the name methane. You might be wondering what meth, the prefix in organic chemistry, has to do with the illegal drug, methamphetamine. Well, the answer is it does refer to something in the chemical structure of that drug, but you'll have to wait till later on this quarter to learn more about it. When it comes to naming straight chain alkanes, it really is this simple. Let's just go down the prefixes so you can hear the names pronounced. If you have a molecule that has one carbon, as we've just seen, you have methane. Two carbons gives you ethane. Three carbons would be propane. And you'll notice some of these sound familiar. You've heard these words before. Four carbons gives you butane. Five would be pentane. Six, hexane. Seven, heptane. Eight, octane. Nine, nonane or nonane. And 10, decane. What would the name of this molecule be? Well, if we count the number of carbons in this alkane, we see that it has a total of six carbons. Because it has six carbons, I'll use the prefix hex and add the suffix ane. This is a molecule of hexane. You'll decide the best way for yourself to memorize these prefixes. Some people like to use mnemonic devices. Other people prefer to just notice certain patterns. If you have any trouble, let me know because there's a whole lot of tricks to it but it's easy because there's really only 10 prefixes to learn, and for the rest of the quarter, we'll be using these in names of much more complex molecules. Now that we know how to name simple alkanes, let's talk a little bit about their properties. These properties apply both to straight chain alkanes as well as more complex alkanes that we'll be looking at later on. In general, alkanes are a pretty bland group of molecules at least in the sense that they tend to have no odor, no color, and no taste. Now that is referring to a completely pure sample of an alkane. In reality, most alkanes that we find in our day-to-day -day lives actually come in mixtures, and they tend to be tricky to purify. So many alkanes actually have sometimes a yellowish color or a distinguished smell. But for instance, here's an example of hexane, it would be difficult to tell hexane apart from water if you had it in its truly pure form because it's completely colorless and tasteless. It is, however, quite a bit more viscous. Hexane happens to be a liquid at room temperature, but alkanes can actually take any of the three general physical states, solids, liquids, or gases. 
which state they take at room temperature depends mostly on the number of carbons in that alkane. So while hexane is a liquid at room temperature, methane, the main component in natural gas, is a gas at room temperature. The state that they take at room temperature depends mostly on the number of carbon atoms that are present in the alkane. That's another way that the prefix can be helpful in determining what their properties will actually be. So why is it that the physical state at room temperature depends on the number of carbons that are in that molecule? Well, the answer brings us back to something we might have to review a little bit from general chemistry. And it's a topic that I know you'll be happy to hear we're gonna review, the topic of intermolecular forces. Yes, I know, you've been thinking, I wish I had more time to talk about intermolecular forces in my life. Well, don't worry, organic chemistry is here to give you that opportunity. So let's take a second just to review intermolecular forces, which means we need to review the topic of polarity. Fortunately, there's not a whole lot to talk about here because alkanes are very simple and very predictable molecules. Because alkanes contain nothing but carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, this will be a pretty short discussion. And the reason is, you may remember from general chemistry, carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds are both nonpolar. What that means, as a little bit of review, is that carbon shares its electrons fairly equally with another carbon atom or with hydrogen atoms. As a result, in a carbon-carbon bond or a carbon-hydrogen bond, the electrons are fairly evenly distributed between the two atoms. The consequence of the fact that the carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds are all nonpolar is that the alkane itself is always a nonpolar molecule. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about methane, ethane, propane, or a much larger molecule like nonane or decane, all of these alkanes are nonpolar. And the result of that is that they have only very weak intermolecular forces. Depending on where you took general chemistry and how much detail your instructor went into, you may remember that intermolecular forces, or the attractions between different molecules, tend to be given names based on how strong they are. The weakest intermolecular forces are referred to as London dispersion forces, or you may have also heard them called van der Waals forces. These are the weakest intermolecular forces, and that's what alkanes have. Later, we'll see that there are organic molecules, not alkanes, that have stronger intermolecular forces, forces like dipole-dipole attractions or hydrogen bonding interactions. We'll talk about those later on. For now, let's stick with the weak intermolecular forces known as London dispersion or van der Waals forces. Again, these are just attractions between molecules. And because all alkanes are nonpolar, they have only these very weak forces. However, the one aspect to this to consider, which you may or may not have discussed in general chemistry, is that the larger a molecule gets, the greater its London dispersion forces become. The reason has to do with why London dispersion forces exist in the first place. London dispersion forces come about when the electrons in a molecule move throughout the molecule and occasionally form a temporary very weak dipole. In other words, while all those electrons are moving around, it's not uncommon for them to bunch up in one spot. The larger a molecule is, the more likely the electrons will become unevenly distributed, just for a split second. So while we think about all alkanes as being nonpolar, the larger the alkane, the more it actually has this very, very slight temporary polarity to it. The consequence of that is that the molecules that are longer, such as nonane and decane, will tend to have more intermolecular forces and as a result, higher boiling points and higher melting points. So anytime you're comparing two alkanes, for instance, methane on the left and hexane on the right, we always know that the more carbon atoms that are present, the slightly more intermolecular forces will affect that molecule and the higher the melting and boiling points. This has consequences for the physical states of alkanes at room temperature. If we look at the values for the melting points and boiling points of alkanes, you'll notice the trend is really obvious. 
as we go up in the number of carbons that are present in a molecule, starting with one carbon in methane and moving up through much longer chains, we see both the melting point and the boiling point get higher. Notice where room temperature happens on this graph. The y-axis of this graph is in degrees Celsius. Room temperature is between 20 and about 23 or 24 degrees Celsius, right about here. So notice that at about this temperature, we've already gone above the boiling point of molecules that have four or less carbons. The consequence of this is that a molecule that has four or less carbons, that's an alkane, will have already boiled at room temperature. This is one of the ways we can figure out the physical states of these alkanes. At room temperature, it's very easy to predict what physical state an alkane will be in based solely on the number of carbons it contains. And this is especially true for straight chain alkanes. When it comes to the simplest alkanes, those that have between one and four carbons, these are molecules that have very, very weak London dispersion or van der Waal attractions. As a result, it doesn't take much energy to overcome those attractions and separate the molecules into a gas. The heat of a common room would be enough to essentially boil these molecules. So molecules that have between one and four carbons, especially alkanes like methane, ethane, propane, and butane, tend to be gas at room temperature. This is why we think of methane as being a component in natural gas or propane as the gas you may use to heat your home or run a grill. Now you may have heard of butane being used as lighter fluid. In that case, the butane is actually put under pressure, which causes it to become liquefied. But under ambient conditions, room temperature and room pressure, butane would be a gas. If we move to alkanes that have more carbons, now we're dealing with molecules that have slightly more attraction between each other. For alkanes with five or more carbons, we're now dealing with a molecule that has enough intermolecular forces to keep it from boiling at room temperature, but not so much as to keep it from turning into a liquid. So when you have five or more carbons, and for now we'll say between five and 15, we tend to be dealing with alkanes that are liquid at room temperature. There's a little bit of debate about the upper limit to this number. For instance, an alkane like pentane, hexane, or heptane with five, six, or seven carbons is definitely a liquid at room temperature. It would be easy for you to pour it from one container to another. But the more carbons that are present, the more viscous these alkanes tend to become. By the time you're dealing with a substance that has 11 or 12 or 13 carbons, it can be so viscous that it's hard to pour. It starts to act a little bit like candle wax that is starting to cool off. By the time you get to 15 carbons, some people would say that's a liquid, other people would say it's more of a waxy solid. We'll use 15 as the cutoff just to keep the numbers simple, but by the time you get to 15 or more carbons, you're definitely dealing with a substance that would be solid at room temperature. We'll talk more about the implications for this when we look at mixtures of hydrocarbons that have alkanes as well as organic compounds with other functional groups. And those mixtures include things like raw petroleum. And one way we separate raw petroleum is by taking advantage of the boiling point. More on that later on. Now that we've talked about the physical properties of alkanes, let's look in a little bit of detail at their chemical properties. The reality is that alkanes, as a group of molecules, are relatively non-reactive. There just are not that many types of chemical reactions that they undergo. And this has some interesting consequences, because it means that if you leave a mixture of alkanes exposed to air or the environment or sunlight, there's a good chance that they may not actually do anything chemically. This has consequences for everything from the alkanes in our food and how they influence shelf life to alkanes that get into the environment and how long they persist and how we clean them up. So alkanes are relatively non-reactive, but there are two major exceptions to that rule. One of those major exceptions 
is the chemical reaction that most people think of when we start to talk about alkanes in general. And that's the reaction of combustion or burning. You've noticed that a lot of the straight chain alkanes that we've been talking about, alkanes such as methane, propane, butane, and octane, are things that we associate with burning for fuel. Combustion is the reaction that releases energy by reacting the alkane with oxygen. And the general formula for a combustion reaction is always the same. You start with a carbon-containing compound, such as an alkane, and react it with oxygen. Typically, you also need a small amount of energy to overcome the activation energy barrier of the reaction. When we're thinking about something like igniting a barbecue or burning gasoline, this is the spark that starts the fire. When the alkane and the oxygen react, their products are carbon dioxide and H2O. The carbon dioxide is a gas, and H2O in this reaction is usually water vapor. At the same time, you release energy when you perform this reaction, and that's why we think of using methane, propane, and other alkanes as fuel. By burning or combusting the alkanes, we release energy. The specific chemical reaction depends on the specific alkane that you use. That means that we have to look at how many carbons are in the alkane to know how to balance the chemical reaction. Here's an example. This is the combustion reaction of propane, the alkane with three carbons, reacting with oxygen through combustion. Notice that as it's written, this is not a balanced reaction. And let me draw your attention to the carbon to show you why. If you notice, there are three carbon atoms in a molecule of propane. But when you look at the product side of this reaction, how many carbon atoms do you see? Well, the carbon exists in carbon dioxide, and there's only one carbon atom. As you learned in general chemistry, that means this reaction is unbalanced. Not all of the atoms are accounted for. So we have to balance this reaction in order to understand exactly which products are actually made. You can review balancing equations from your general chemistry material, but when it comes to combustion, there's an easy trick. Notice that all of the carbons from your alkane, in this case, the three carbons in propane, have to become the carbon in carbon dioxide. That means that if I start out with an alkane that has three carbons, I must make three molecules of carbon dioxide. This has important consequences for things like understanding how much carbon dioxide is released when we burn certain fuels. When you burn propane with three carbons, you must produce three molecules of carbon dioxide. If you burn octane, which has eight carbons, even without writing out the balanced reaction, we know right away it must produce eight molecules of carbon dioxide. Now this equation isn't fully balanced, but for the purposes of our class, if you can make the association between the number of carbons in the alkane and the number of carbons in carbon dioxide, that's enough for me. If you did want to fully this balance this equation, we'd have to also recognize that you require five molecules of oxygen, and that produces three molecules of carbon dioxide and four molecules of H2O. One more note about this combustion reaction. This is what's called a complete combustion because it's balanced, all the atoms are accounted for, and the products are only carbon dioxide and water, as well as the energy that's released. It's also possible to perform what's called an incomplete combustion. Incomplete combustion occurs when there's not a perfect ratio of alkane to oxygen molecules. The consequence is that you tend to get byproducts, such as carbon monoxide, that form during the reaction. This is often the difference between what we refer to as clean burning fuels and dirty or sooty burning fuels. A clean burning fuel gives you the most complete combustion possible. In other words, the only products are carbon dioxide and water. Dirtier fuels, or the types of fuels that you may have burned in your own experience that leave soot and dark residues on things, those are the products of an incomplete combustion. There's one other type of chemical reaction that alkanes readily undergo, and it's a process called halogenation. You may remember from general chemistry 
that the halogens refer to group 7 on the periodic table. It's essentially the second to last column on the right side of the table, and it includes the elements of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and the rare radioactive element astatine. You may also remember that the halogens are very unlikely to be found as single atoms, but instead are much more stable in their diatomic form. The result of that is that it's rare to find a single atom of fluorine, but it's fairly common to see fluorine in its more stable diatomic form as F2, and this is true for the other elements in the halogens as well. Halogenation refers to adding one or more halogen atoms to an existing molecule. Let's look at the simplest example of halogenating the simplest alkane, which is methane. We already know that the methane molecule contains one carbon and four hydrogens. When we halogenate it, we can replace one or more of these hydrogens with a halogen. The two most common halogens that we see in reactions are Cl2 or Br2, chlorine or bromine. So while we can use the term halogenation as a general term, you'll also hear the terms chlorination, which refers to adding the Cl2 molecule, or bromination, which refers to adding the Br2 molecule. The other halogens can also undergo this reaction, but it's less common in practical applications. So let's do a chlorination reaction. When we react methane with a chlorine molecule, what happens is a fairly complex molecular process. In the end, it's fairly hard to predict exactly what will happen because there's actually several different ways this reaction can proceed. One way it can proceed is for only one of those hydrogens to actually be replaced with a chlorine. That would give us this product. We don't know how to name this product yet, but we can see that one hydrogen has been replaced with one chlorine. That would also mean that I have a product of HCl because that's the remaining chlorine and hydrogen atom. While that's all fine and good, and it's definitely one possibility, the truth is, in reality, one or more chlorines can actually be replaced. So it's just as likely that our product could have two chlorine atoms that have replaced two hydrogens. Now, that complicates what our other product would be because it seems to imply that there'd also be an H2. But let me tell you one thing you'll really enjoy about organic chemistry. This is not the most important thing about the reaction. So many times in organic chemistry, we leave off some of the products. While that may seem like an egregious violation of what we learned in general chemistry, it has to do with the reality of organic chemistry and how complex the molecules become. These small inorganic products usually aren't that important to us, so many times we simply leave them off. There are other possible products of this reaction. We've seen that you could replace one hydrogen, you could replace two hydrogen, or you could just as easily end up with a molecule that has three hydrogen replaced by chlorine atoms. One thing you might notice about this is that it would appear that we only have two chlorine atoms that we're working with. Again, in organic chemistry, we usually strive towards the most reasonable interpretation of what's on paper. The reality is, there's no way that you actually added just one single Cl2 to this reaction. So some of the chlorine would have come from other molecules of diatomic chlorine. Finally, the last possible product would have to do with having all four of the hydrogen replaced. This is one of the difficulties with halogenation, is most likely each one of these could occur, and in fact, your final product would probably be a mixture of all four of these different possibilities. These are what we would generally refer to as being chloroalkanes, because they're essentially an alkane molecule that has some hydrogen replaced by chlorine. The same would be true if we do a bromine reaction. Now, looking at the screen, Notice that one tiny little methane molecule gave us four possible products. And imagine now if we start to look at longer molecules like ethane, propane, butane, and so on. It gets fairly complicated. This is one of the reasons that halogenation reactions 
can be difficult to use on an industrial level. If you were actually trying to prepare just one of these compounds, you'd have to imply some very specific chemistry to either prevent the other reactions from happening or to purify your final compound. For this reason, when we talk about halogenation, we're usually referring to any of the possibilities that could occur, and I'll generally expect you to just be able to suggest some, but not all of the possible products from either a chlorination or a bromination of an alkane.